Well, good morning and happy new year. It's great to be together this morning in church, whether you're gathered here in person or whether you're watching online, it's so good to be in worship together. And I hope that your new year is off to a good start. One thing I'm excited about is that no matter how difficult and challenging and unpredictable 2020 has been, we can take full assurance and have full confidence that God is with us, Jesus is on the throne, and I I believe good things are in store for us. And uh, so I'm excited about what God has in store, even though we're still in the midst of this frustrating, challenging, and unpredictable time. Jesus is still on the throne, and God has great things, so uh, I'm excited to lean into this new year. Um, For these first few weeks, we're going to be looking at growth and how Jesus wants us to grow, and today we're going to be looking at one word that we can focus on that can give us guidance and direction in our lives as we seek to be who God wants us to be. And then starting next week, we're going to begin a new series called Growth. And each of those letters in growth stand for different practices, different uh, focuses we can have as we seek to become who Jesus wants us to be. So I'm looking forward, whether you're here in person or whether you're online, we're um, excited about how God is going to lead us towards growth in this new year. I'm starting a new Bible study at the end of this month. I'm excited about this because it will get us into God's Word, the book of Matthew, and it'll help us to understand the the history and the background of Matthew, how Jesus relates to the Old Testament, and a lot of other important things as we desire to be students of God's Word. And so I'm going to offer this on Wednesday mornings, uh, beginning January 27th at 10.30 in the morning. Uh, If there are those of you who would like to meet in the evening, we will gather on Tuesday evenings at 6.30. So just please um, send me a text or an email if you'd like to order a book or sign up. You don't have to have a book, but the books are $13 and include great teaching by uh, Ben Witherington from Asbury Seminary. We've had him at Family Bible Camp, and he's an outstanding teacher of the Bible, Um, one of the world's premier New Testament scholars, and uh, look forward to having having a, uh, maybe a seven to eight minute video each week followed by discussion and reading and uh, time in God's word. So there's more information in the, the bulletin this morning. Let's enter into worship and, and pray. Gracious God, we thank you that in the midst of lives that can be frustrating and chaotic and uncertain and unpredictable, uh, lives marked by a pandemic and by uh, all kinds of, of challenges and diagnoses and relational issues and job insecurity and all of these things, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are on the throne and you are ready to meet us here. Whether we are here physically within the church building or whether we are watching online, you love us, you are concerned about our lives, and you want to enter in and pour out your grace upon us. And so God, as we begin this new year, 2021, we offer our lives to you. We offer you our hearts, we offer you our decisions, we offer you uh, our trust, and God, we pray that you would meet us here and that you would work deep within us. Lord, unite our hearts together as a family of faith. Help us to be your hands and feet to a a lost and needy world. God, help us to shine with the light of Christ into a world of darkness and despair. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have called us. You are raising us up as a church to be your people, to be the greatest force for good this world will ever know. So Lord Jesus, pour your spirit out upon us, draw us closer together, and work in our hearts as we seek you here this morning. May you be pleased and glorified through everything that happens. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Jesus is on the throne and we are paying attention to him. All is well. It doesn't mean that our circumstances are easy, but our focus is in the right place and our eyes are on our source of hope that we have, uh, the the greatest hope this world will ever know, and that's Christ. Um, Before we go to God's word, we're going to spend some time in prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God, you are so good. And once again, as we enter into this new year, we know that you are our source of hope and strength. You are the light of the world. You are the one who has come to bring life to us, both physical life and spiritual life, everlasting life. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice, including myself, that, Lord, we would not put you on the back burner, we would not take you for granted, but that 2021 would be a year of leaning in and pursuing you and loving you and serving you with everything that we have. God, it's so easy to be distracted, it's so easy to be divided, it's so easy to take our eyes off you and focus on uh, the distractions and the division and the despair of this world, but Jesus, we pray that you would help us to refocus our gaze on you and you alone, because you are the source of our faith and the source of our lives. 
Lord God, we pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds to your truth, to the power of your life-changing word. God, we know that whether we are two months old or 102 years old, you are not finished with us. You are wanting us to grow uh, and grow in physical health and mental and emotional health and spiritual health. And so, Lord, we offer you our lives asking for you to work within us. Just as a, a potter takes a lump of clay and molds it and forms it, God, we pray that we would be clay in your hands, that you, the master potter can take and shape and mold so that we look and act and live more like Jesus. God, today we lift up all those who are sick, all those who need your healing power at work within them. We pray for Dennis Courtney and Pam Post and Pat Heater, for all who are battling COVID, uh, some who are on ventilators, so many who are on our hearts. God, we know that you can simply speak the word and they can be made well. So Jesus, we trust in you for healing, for your power to be made manifest to those who are in need. Uh, God, we lift our families to you. We pray that our marriages would grow stronger in this year. We pray that relationships between parents and children would grow stronger, that you would give all of us greater understanding, greater love, greater compassion, greater wisdom as to how we can have strong and growing relationships with our loved ones. Lord, lead us to be your hands and feet, not to stay to ourselves, not to just stay in our isolated comfort zones, but God, to move out beyond the walls of this church, beyond the walls of our homes, to be your hands and your feet. Strengthen us as your people, even as we fight through the distraction and the, uh, um, the difficulty of life during this pandemic. God, it doesn't mean that you have any less power to take our lives and pour your grace into us. So Lord, we trust in you today. Jesus, speak to our hearts, move in our lives, in Jesus' name, amen. And all God's people said, amen. Well, I'm excited about how God has been speaking to me this past week as I've thought about what to preach on this first Sunday of the new year. And again, next week we'll start a new six-week series on growth, focusing on how we can grow as God's people. Uh, but today we're going to look at one strategy, one approach that's, that many have found to be helpful in their Christian lives, and that's to focus on one word that can be used as a, as a place to um, focus, as a, as a place of guidance, and as a place to think about the direction that God wants us to go in our lives. So we're going to talk about the one-word approach. Um, in other words, instead of writing down a lot of New Year's resolutions that then we break by January 2nd or 3rd, has anyone broken a New Year's resolution already? Anyone want to own that? Um, rather than you know, writing down all these complicated New Year's resolutions, this approach that we're going to talk about today is about writing down one word that we can focus on. And I think this came from several different places. My sister's pastor in North Carolina, Mike Ashcraft, wrote a book, One Word That Will Change Your Life. Also, a motivational speaker and author named John Gordon wrote a book about the exact same time, about eight or nine years ago, just about the power of one word as a way to focus our minds and the ways that we want to grow. And uh, by the way, I think Buffalo Bills coach Sean McDermott is a follower of John Gordon, because John Gordon always talks about being humble and hungry. That's two words, but two words, you know, that we can probably handle that. But he's always telling the Bills to stay humble and hungry and uh, just, you know, a way to focus on who we want to be and how we want to grow. So my hope and prayer for each of us today is that we would uh, be committed to praying and seeking God for one word, one way that he wants us to grow and uh, I'll be sharing about that more in a little bit. But before we get to that one word focus, I want us to look at God's word, Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. And we're going to dive into these scriptures. And what's interesting is this is the one account we have in the scriptures between Jesus' infancy and when he was a 30-year-old man beginning his ministry as he came to preach and teach and heal and be the savior of the world, this is the one account that we have between his infancy and when he was about age 30. And it was when he was 12 years old. And uh, such a powerful scripture. And I invite you to open your Bibles, or I don't know if it'll be on the screen or not, but Luke chapter 2, verse, there it is, Luke 2, 41 to 52. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover, when he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. 
After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. As we focus on this passage, it's been said that Jesus' childhood is like a walled garden, a beautiful walled garden surrounded that nobody has ever looked into except that one flower, Luke, the gospel writer Luke, has plucked one flower from this garden and uh, offered us uh, that one flower, and that's what we have here. So it's just a treasure of one account of Jesus as he was growing to become who Um, who he was sent to be as the Son of God and as the Savior of the world. Why is this significant? Jesus was 12 years old. And get this, like modern adolescence in our world is kind of a new thing. You know, adolescence, it begins with puberty and ends with economy when, you know, at some point um, we reach independence. But that, that adolescence construction was not something that they were that was on their minds in the ancient world. And at the age of 12, Jewish boys were preparing to assume adult responsibility at age 13. And maybe that's a challenge to some of the boys who are, you know, in the 13 to 16-year-old range. In the ancient world, they were were assuming adult responsibility. And and the reason Jesus was left behind was probably because he was at this pivotal age of transition. You know, so Mary was probably thinking, Jesus is almost an adult. He's almost 13. He's probably back with Joseph and the men walking with them. And Joseph, during this caravan, as they were leaving Jerusalem, would have thought, well, Jesus is 12. He's with his mother. He's with the women. He's with the children up in front of the caravan. That's probably where he is. And so Joseph and Mary, because Jesus was right at this transition age, were just assuming he was probably with the other part of the caravan, either with the men or with the women and children, because he was right at that in-between year. But it's significant that as Jesus is at the age when Jewish boys were being mentored and becoming aware of who they were supposed to be as adult men, Jesus was focused on his heavenly father. And and this is so powerful. So Mary, she can you imagine if you've lost your kid in a busy city and it's been two or three days? They see the way it worked is they probably left Jerusalem, the caravan would have traveled for a day, they would have set up camp for the night, and Mary and Joseph would have come together and they would have had a great conversation. Can you imagine it? Wait, isn't Jesus with you? No, I thought he was with you. I'm sure this went really well, you know. And then they realized, you know, Jesus is not with us, and I'm sure they had a very anxious night of sleep, and then the next day they would have traveled back, and then the third day they finally found him at the temple courts, talking, engaging in conversation with the religious leaders and with the teachers of the law. And after three days, they finally find him there, Luke 2, 48. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I, get this line, your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And now look what 12-year-old Jesus does and says. Jesus replies, why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Did you see what he's doing? Mom, you're so focused on you and my earthly father, I'm at the age when I'm supposed to be learning from my father. And I'm sure Jesus was picking up the the builder, carpenter trade from his earthly father, but Jesus knew as a 12-year-old boy about to assume adult responsibility, he had to be in his heavenly father's house, learning, being mentored, growing to be the person God sent him to be. Notice I'm not saying God created him to be because Jesus is not created. He's the son of God. He is the divine son of God who was not created but was sent from God, uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit. But I love what Jesus does. So in that moment, Mary and Joseph were not grasping the significance that as a 12-year-old boy ready to assume the, the adult male responsibility that he would be about his heavenly father, being mentored, soaking up who his heavenly father wanted him to be. 
And it's interesting that in that moment, Mary and Joseph were not grasping the significance of what Jesus was saying, that Jesus has a special relationship with God, and the mission and the purpose that he has from, the, from God is a divine one. You know, it's, it's a good lesson for us. God has a mission and a purpose for, for us, for you and me. And I hope that you're aware of that. Whether you're here today or you're watching online, God has a mission and a purpose for you that is beyond just what you see and could experience in the the earthly realm. He has a divine, God-shaped mission and purpose. You were created to glorify God, to live for Jesus and shine the light of Christ to your friends, to your co-workers, to your family. But Mary, because she was focused on earthly concerns, she wasn't able to grasp the bigger picture of what was happening. And it's an important message for us. When we are anxious and we're stressed and we're so focused on our earthly lives, it's easy to take our eyes off God. Whereas God wants us to lean in and slow down and quiet our hearts and listen for his voice so that we have direction and purpose from him. So we have all this uh, transpire, and then in Luke 2.52 gives us, Jesus, Luke 2.52 gives us the last statement we have about Jesus' childhood. It says, and Jesus grew in wisdom. Think about what, how Jesus grew, because this is going to be a focus for us as we think about how God wants us to grow. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. We could unpack so much about this passage, but as we begin 2021, I want us to think about what would it look like for us to grow in wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is godly knowledge, the truth of God that's applied to our lives, to our decision-making, to how we live. It's one thing to know what the Bible says. It's another thing to know how to take what the Bible says in God's truth and apply it to our daily living, our decision-making, how we interact with people the relationships that we have, how we spend our money, how we, uh, how we go about our work, how we do all these things. That's all about godly wisdom. Jesus grew in stature. Now, a lot of us who are adults, you know, we have trouble growing the stature and the growing thing. Probably some of you are concerned about the shrinking thing. So maybe we don't grow like some of the young people here. You're growing. You got this down. But for many of us, I think we can translate this to our physical health. And so if Jesus grew in stature, that was a way that God wanted him to grow and mature. What about our physical health? Are we being stewards of the bodies that God gave us? Are we thinking and reminding ourselves that we are temples of the Holy Spirit, and so we should care for our bodies and be good stewards of them? Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature, and he grew in favor with God and people. I want to dwell on that last one for a little bit. Jesus grew in favor with God and people. What's the number one commandment we have in the scriptures? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's what all the other uh, commandments hang on, is loving God and loving people. When we think about our relationships and our interactions with other people, I want to talk about what one commentator described as, as different dimensions of living. One-dimensional living is when we are the focal point in the center of our lives. The only thing that concerns our minds is, you know, what are my expectations, what are my needs, and are people meeting those? I'm the center of the universe. I'm about what is best for me, what makes me happy. That's one-dimensional living. Obviously, that's not a Christ-centered way of living. Two-dimensional living is a little better because we think about our life and we think about our relationships with other human beings, and we think, okay, son, daughter, spouse. This is what we need to to get along and to work together. Or our coworker or our boss, and it's about uh, two people working together to try to make their way through, and that's two-dimensional living. Mary, in this passage, was focused on two-dimensional living. Jesus, we do a lot for you. You shouldn't be running off and making yourself hard to find. You know, she's focused on this two-dimensional living. Jesus, if we're going to work together, if we're going to get along, you can't treat your father and me like this. We've been anxiously searching for you. That's where Mary's focus was. It's better than one-dimensional living, but it's not as good as three-dimensional living. What is three-dimensional living? Well, that's when we recognize that God, and through the presence of the Holy Spirit, wants to be involved, intimately involved, in all of our relationships. See, when we think about our lives, when we think about our families, 
our relationships in our marriages, our relationships with our children, our relationships as a body of Christ. Jesus doesn't just want us to ask him for help in a relationship. He does want us to do that, but Jesus actually wants to come and be in the center of those relationships. He doesn't want us to just seek his help so that he can remain outside of a relationship. He wants to come and be a part, so it's a three-dimensional way of living and relating. In other words, Christ is concerned about your marriage, yes, but he's so concerned about it, he wants to be the center of it. He wants to be the center of every relationship that we have, and that's three-dimensional living. Jesus was thinking about his mom and dad. It says that Jesus went with them and that he was obedient to them. Jesus was, he was a good 12-year-old kid. He was obedient, but he was also focused on his heavenly father and who his heavenly father wanted him to be and how his heavenly father wanted him to live. And so as a 12-year-old, Jesus was already modeling three-dimensional living. Jesus grew in favor with God and people. Not, hey, what do I want out of life and my relationships? And not just, hey, how are we going to work together to get through this? But when we come together and we say, hey, let's put Christ at the center of this relationship. What would it look like for us to interact together with Christ and his presence in the middle of us Working, to, working together so that we together are about his heart, so that we are together are about his plans. One thing I often share with married couples, and I, I've talked about this before, but is if we think about our lives with this three-dimensional living in terms of a triangle, if there are three points on a triangle and it's you and your spouse, or, or you could think about it as you and a child, really in a, any relationship it works, but especially with husbands and wives, if you are the two lower points of the triangle and Christ is the top point in the triangle and the two people are both pursuing Christ with everything that they have, what happens to the, the husband and the wife as they pursue Christ together? It brings all three together into one focal point, and that's what Christ wants for us. Husbands, wives, Jesus, pursuing Christ together, and that brings such unity. If you have two people who are both living one-dimensionally, both just focusing on what they want and what they need and what their expectations are, it's like, you know, it's like popcorn popping around inside a popcorn maker. That wasn't in the notes, but that's what it's like, you know, just two people bouncing around. But when we think of our lives as a triangle with Christ at the top and we pursue him, it brings us together. How does Jesus want us to handle our finances? How does Jesus want us to work together and, and focus on him in our parenting? How does Jesus want us to, to focus on his plan, his will for our lives as we think about our future and where we're going together? How does Jesus want us not just to be a couple where it's all about our happiness, but where it's about how has God called us together to be one flesh, one unit, one partnership where we are created, we're brought together to serve the Lord together, to have outwardly focused lives where it's not just about us and our happiness, but it's about God has called us together, yes, for companionship and blessing, but first and foremost so that together we can spur one another on in love as we seek to be his hands and feet to our children, to our community, to our world. That's three-dimensional living. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and people, which leads us to transition into how can we grow in godly wisdom and in physical health and stewardship of our bodies and in our relationships with God and with one another. And that's what we're going to focus on as we think about using the power of one word to focus us in the ways that God wants us to grow. G.K. Chesterton, Chesterton said this, the object of a new year is not that we should have a new year. It is that we should have a new soul. I like that. A lot of people think, well, I couldn't stand 2020. Now we're in 2021. I hope 2021 is better. And I hate to say it, but there's nothing just about a date change on the calendar that means everything is different and everything is new. It's Jesus who's working in our lives who makes all things new. And that's not dependent on the date on a calendar. Yes, we want to set 2020 aside. We want to have God heal the past and lead us into the new. But first and foremost, that's not going to happen because we turn the page on our calendar or because we swipe a little farther down on our phone so that we're into 2021. That happens as we say, Jesus, you are the one who makes all things new. You are the one who gives me possibilities for growth and healing and wholeness and purpose. So I want us to think about how God is calling us to grow in wisdom and in stature, physical health, and in favor with God and people. 
So as we think about the power of one word, you know, somebody might push back and say, well, Pastor Dave, I don't know where in the Bible this fad of just pick one word and that'll help you grow. But I think there's a lot in Scripture that's about focusing our minds on what is right and what is true and what is good. I think about Romans 12, 2, where the Apostle Paul writes, do not conform to the pattern of this world. What would the pattern of this world be? Selfishness, get what you can get for yourself, greed, pursue your own pleasure at whatever cost to others. If it feels good, do it, whatever comes to mind. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. One of the things this picking one word can do is it can renew our minds. It can shift the direction of our minds. Then you will be able to test and approve, Paul says, what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So we want our one word to be something that focuses our minds or redirects us on a God-honoring change or a God-honoring focus that that can lead to movement and direction in a God-honoring path. So this is not something that will come immediately. Maybe somebody will have your, you'll have your one word by the time you walk out of here today. But I would encourage you to just sit in prayer and spend some time still before God saying, Lord, what are the challenges and the struggles that I've had daily throughout this past year or in this season of my life? And Lord, what is one word that in a positive way could redirect me on something that would honor you and lead towards change? Um, some people share these on social media, and I've been reading a lot of these on social media because I follow John Gordon and others, and that he says, what's your one word for the year and why? And uh, I'll just share a little bit, and um, I'll do some that are general, and I'll share some that are actual uh, reflections from people. But if you struggle with anxiety, maybe your one word is peace, and you want to just pray about God's peace and write down scriptures and do some study and reflection around how God wants to bring peace to your heart and life and the God of peace will be with you. I think there's so many uh, passages and verses, Philippians 4 and others about God's peace. John chapter 14, where Jesus is going to the cross, and he says to his disciples, and he says to us today, I believe, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. And so you have your one word, and then a scripture verse that goes along with it. You know, maybe somebody, a teenager or somebody else, struggles with identity or body image, uh, struggling with how they look or what they weigh, and maybe your word is created, you know, to remember that you are created by God. And a Bible verse that would go along with that from the Psalms, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That would be a great focus, a great word to remember. It's about who God is creating me to be. Or maybe you feel rejected or like you're an outcast or you're lonely, and God might bring to your mind, beloved, that you are precious to God. You are God's beloved. And so you write the word beloved on a card, you put it on your refrigerator, you find verses about how you are God's beloved. Maybe Isaiah 43 or other passages that are about how you are God's beloved and you are precious to him. So that every time you feel kicked aside or like a social outcast, you remember that you are God's beloved. And that's your word for the year that helps you to grow into an identity of knowing that you are precious and loved by God. There's all kinds of things, though, as you can see. If you're, if you're struggling with greed and anxiety about finances, maybe your word is generosity or trust. Or if you struggle with pornography, maybe the word is purity. Or if you are in despair, the word can be hope. And then you focus on that, you pray about it, and you, you search God's word and study all that God says about these words so that what God's word says can be a promise for the promises for you so that you can lean into this and live into this in the new year. But I want you to think and pray about one word that can become the focus of your learning, your scripture study, and your prayer life. So let me share a few examples from real people um, from social media or in other places. Um, in a previous year, my sister Beth was uh, focused on how she always wants to control things. She struggles, she's probably the only one, but she struggles a little bit with anxiety and stress when things don't go her way and how she wants to control everything. And so she said this, my one word, this was back a few years ago, my one word for 2017 is release. I'm scared to even share this as I try to keep controlling things. You would think by now I would know that God is in charge and I am not. But there's a, a time where you think, oh, I can't control this, I'm not in charge, this is bothering me, and then the word is release. Release it to God and God's control as a way to focus the mind and the heart. 
Uh, Christopher Romano wrote on Twitter, relationship is my one word for 2021. Setting my focus on developing and deepening healthy and authentic relationships, starting with Jesus, my wife and children, and then extending outward. But isn't that great? It is a great way to focus relationships to be a priority. Wesley Woods, the man on Twitter, said freedom, spiritual freedom, financial freedom, time freedom. That's his word. Um, Jason Romano said, my one word for 2021 is Jesus. I want to learn more about Jesus. I want to live more like Jesus, serve more like Jesus, care for others like Jesus, be patient like Jesus, be kind like Jesus. And then in capital letters, he says, love like Jesus. That's his one word. So let's be praying about one word that God will bring to your mind to help shape your growth and your life in this new year. So naturally, I was thinking, God, I'm preaching on this. You know, can you give me a word? You know, I was, I was walking down Shady Side Road thinking, Lord, I think it's time that you give me a word so that I can decide on a word and, and have that to share on Sunday morning. And so this was earlier in the week. I said, Lord, I have to decide on a word. I can't decide. Help me decide. And then the Holy Spirit hit me like a two by four across the head. There's your word. Decide. I'm like, no, that's what I want. I want to decide on a word. And I just felt God was saying, no, that's your word, decide. And I started thinking about it and how it's not just me on my human, in my human faculties to think about deciding, but I started to lean into this and I, and I got really excited about it because it's about thinking, I am not a victim. I am not powerless. I am not helpless. But through the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life and the truth of God's word, I can make decisions. I can decide how am I going to respond in that interaction? How am I going to decide when it comes to having a fourth or fifth piece of cake? Hopefully I make the decision before the fourth or fifth piece of cake. But in everything, whether it's physical health or a mindset or an attitude or a relationship, I'm not helpless. I'm not powerless. I can decide through the power of the Spirit and the truth of God's Word. And I started getting jazzed about that, thinking, this is so liberating. It's so empowering to think about my ability to decide through the power of the Spirit and the truth of God's Word. And I thought, thank you, God. And then I started thinking about Bible verses. And, you know, you start running with this. And I hope you have the same experience where all of a sudden it just motivates you towards further growth in grace. And I thought about Joshua 24, where Joshua makes that bold statement, choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And, and of course, choose and decide they're close enough. But you can see where I'm going, and you, you start praying and reading Scripture, and this word becomes a catalyst for forward movement and growth in our lives. I would encourage you, pray about it, find Scripture and, and dive into Scriptures about it, and then talk. This is a great thing for you to talk about as, as husbands and wives, as family members with your kids. What is a way that you want to grow, and what is a word that helps focus you, and then what is some Scripture? What are some Scripture verses that you can write that will help give clarity and um, thrust behind all of this? And so share your one word. If you want to, we don't want to go around and like be the Pharisee. Hey, my one word is I'm, you know, what, I don't know. We want to be careful how we do this, but it can be encouraging for us to share our words uh, with one another as the body of Christ so that we can spur one another on and we can help bring accountability and encouragement as we seek to focus on our one word. And that's something I hope we'll do through social media. Uh, maybe we can have a little board out here where we write down our word on a piece of paper and maybe color it or add some scripture, but this is something we want to encourage one another with. We want to encourage our family members with as we seek to grow and change as followers of Christ. I'll I'll close with this story, Um, and and it's about a coffee mug, and hopefully this helps to uh, wrap things up and and land this message in 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 a helpful way. But we had, I had this problem going back weeks with these certain mugs in our cupboard, And I was reminded just a day or two ago when I had the same problem, and I had to use this mug because all the other mugs were in the dishwasher. But here's the problem. When I pour a first hot pot of coffee into the mug and drink my coffee, everything is fine. The problem is we have a bun coffee maker. We don't like to turn the warming plate on because it doesn't turn off, and so rather than have a problem, we just leave the warming plate off. And so when I go to get a second mug of coffee, it's not real tasty. It's, it's, the temperature has lowered. So I take the pot, I pour it into this mug, and then I put the mug in the microwave, nuke it for 30 to 40 seconds, hoping that will bring the coffee up to, up to taste, up to the right temperature. Here's the problem when I go to the coffee, or when I go to the microwave after having it in, in for 30 or 40 seconds. I take my hand, I, I open the door, I reach in, I grab the handle, 
And, it, and it's like Harry from Home Alone when he grabs the hot doorknob. You know, it's like, wowzer, so hot. And I think I'm kind of a wuss when it comes to this because I'm always at Tim Hortons when they give me my coffee and I'm always like, can I have a sleeve, please? You know, I never feel very manly at Tim Hortons. <laughs> it's just a side thing. You know, it's like, can I have a sleeve to go with my coffee and my Tim bits? Thank you. You know, but anyway, so I grab the, the handle on this mug and it's so hot. And then I actually have to grab a napkin, wrap it around the, the handle. And then I drink and I burn my lips. And then I actually tilt the mug to drink the coffee. And it's this disgusting, lukewarm, you know, temperature. And I think here the mug is like boiling hot. The handle is boiling hot, and then you get the mug to your lips, and the, the coffee is so lukewarm. And I thought, that's a picture of what we do not want for our spiritual lives. When we have just enough superficial religiosity, so it looks like we're warmed up, so it looks like there's change on the outside, but the inside is lukewarm and practically unchanged. And, and isn't that what we find frustrating in our interactions with one another? And isn't that what the world finds offensive? And isn't that what we, if we're really honest, we just really can't stand about ourselves when we want change and we go through the motions of our lives and there's a little bit of change or effect on the outside, but the inside, we do not have the passion for Jesus. A vibrant, authentic, life-changing, contagious faith that starts on the inside and then works its way out. I know that for myself and for us as a church family, what I desire is the exact opposite, where the change, the, the fire, the power of God, the love of Jesus is set aflame within us so that from the inside out, we are made more like Christ. And then that works its way to the outside. And, but it all begins on the inside and works its way out. And so what I'm hoping as we begin this year, as we think about how do I want to press into God and grow? in wisdom, in making godly decisions, taking God's word, the, the truth that is God-honoring and applying it to my daily decisions. Wisdom, stature, physical health, focusing on being stewards of our bodies and our relationships with God and others. Having a contagious love within us that honors God and, and speaks to the world that, that we are followers of Christ. You know, not some artificial, superficial um, thing where we act like Pharisees and are holier than thou, but that within we have an authentic, vibrant, passionate love for Jesus that starts inside and works its way out. That's the kind of change that God wants for us. And I believe that's possible, not just because in our human wisdom we, we write down a word, but because we spend time before our Heavenly Father, just like Jesus focused on the business of His Heavenly Father and His Heavenly Father's house, we say, Lord, give me a word that will direct how you want me to grow and change and thrive and live in my spiritual life. And I believe God will honor that. You know, the scripture says, you know, ask, seek, and you will find. You know, ask and it will be given to you. And I believe that's what God would love for us. God would smile upon us if we say, Lord, as we begin 2021, I am yours. What's happened in the past, forgive me, release me, set me free, heal me, and Lord, help me to live into 2021 in a way that would please you and honor you, growing as a man, as a woman, as a child after your heart filled with the love of Christ, with a desire to serve, not living one-dimensionally where it's all about me, two-dimensionally where it's just about us, but three-dimensionally where Christ is the center of our lives and our relationships. And so what is your one word? Let's spend some time in these coming days praying about it, writing down words, asking God to clarify and refine, seeking God's word that goes along with those words, sharing them with family, when and how appropriate, sharing it with one another and encouraging one another and holding one another accountable so that God can do that genuine, powerful work of change and growth from the inside out. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are able to take our lives, no matter how dirty or messy or um, out of kilter or, or wayward, you are able to take our lives and through your grace, you are able to forgive us, make us new, and set us on a path that would honor you. So Lord Jesus, I pray that you would speak to our hearts about the one word that you want us to focus on that would lead us 
and lead us towards growth and change in this new year. And God, give us wisdom as to how we can really study and lean into these words, going to your word, the truth of your scriptures, and encouraging one another as we share our words and focus on how we want to grow. May this be a catalyst for how you want to draw us together and move us forward as your people. Lord, we love you. We pray that you would work in us in a powerful way in 2021. We offer our lives, our families, our concerns to you, asking for you to make us new because we know that is your business. You are in the business of making all things new, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, thanks so much for worshiping with us, church, and uh, if there's any way that we can be of help to you, if you want to um, just to ask for, seek guidance, direction, prayer, as you think about how you want to grow and change in this new year, um, send me a message. Our leaders would love to meet with you, talk with you, pray with you. Um, if you're interested in the Matthew Bible study, let me know. If you have questions, you can uh, shoot them my way. And um, church, let's just lean into all that God has for us. You know, God is not finished with us yet. The, I believe the best days are yet to come. And uh, let's let, really lean into God and God's grace as we think about who he's calling us to be, both as individuals, but as families, as, as married um, people, as a church family. Let's really lean into who God is calling us to be, not just for ourselves, but for the world, for the sake of God and his glory. So as you go from this place, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. To all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Have a great day and a great week.